Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Mike Edison, author of the new book, Dirty, 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 of Playboys, Pigs, and Penthouse Poppers. Stick around, especially you, Mr. Hefner. <laughs> Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of Lenny Bruce, Bob Guccione Sr., and Al Goldstein fans. You see where this is going yet? In the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Hugh Hefner and Playboy, Bob Guccione Sr., and Penthouse. Al Goldstein and Screw. Larry Flint and Hustler. Those are just a few of the topics I'll be discussing today with my guest, Mike Edison author of a glorious romp through the modern history of sex magazine publishing, Dirty, 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 of Playboys, Pigs, and Penthouse Poppers. I'm telling you this sort of up front so that those of you with sensitive, sensitive moral constitutions, or if you're simply under the age of 18, will have plenty of time to watch and or listen to something else. You might even hear a word or two about Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, Linda Lovelace, or even Harry Reams. Now, for those who remain, I'm looking at you, I think you'll find this conversation at times provocative, maybe a little shocking, but rarely dull. This is Mike Edison's second visit to Mr. Media. The first was to discuss I Have Fun Everywhere I Go, Savage Tales of Pot, Porn, Punk Rock, Pro Wrestling, Talking Apes, Evil Bosses, Dirty Blues, America. And he talks the way he writes. Rat-a-tat-tat, take no prisoners, waste no words, leave the reader no choice but to keep turning the pages, and the listener no choice but to stay tuned. Edison is a longtime magazine writer, also formerly the grand inhaler of High Times Magazine, editor at Screw, <laughs> and a prolific staff letter writer at Penthouse. You know, the kind that began, Dear Penthouse, I never thought it would happen to me, but... Personally, I think much of his style comes from his other obsession. He's a rock and roll drummer, and there's always a rhythm to his presentation, whether he's talking with his lips or his hands. Mike Edison, welcome back to Mr. Media. Hey, good morning, Bob. It's good to see you, and thanks for all those nice words. My pleasure. Always good to, always good to talk to you, and uh, this time uh, to see you. Uh, I think, the, I think the, the only way this is going to... People are going to want more from this is they're going to want pictures of the things we talk about, and they can, they can go <laughs> on the Internet for that. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, that, that's what the Internet's for. They're oddly, or uh, maybe not so oddly, in fact, quite on purpose, there are no photos in my book. And I think some things are best left to the imagination. There's some nice pictures on the cover, though, nice illustrations. I, I like those. Oh, those yeah, the pinup girls are, are good. But, you know, the crazy thing about um, the book called Dirty, Dirty, Dirty is, you know, America's got such a weird relationship with sex. You know, it's this thing that we love but we're afraid to talk about. It's, you know, this thing that we fear but run towards to, runs towards all the time. And I'm finding that people are confusing my book with the thing itself. Like, there's, like, genuine fear of, and confusion of what to do with it exactly. I saw it in uh, Shakespeare and Company, a bookstore here in New York, um, racked on a big table, and this is before Christmas, with the Kama Sutra and the Joy of Sex. <laughs> uh, okay. This is the sound of me not selling books. Because it's a pop culture history, right? You know, it's a social history. It's um, a romp, as you said. It's 60 years of American culture on the newsstand. It goes from Eisenhower to Clinton, more or less. And it's very much about... Um, that part of America, this road that we traveled, sort of uh, losing and um, trying to reclaim our innocence despite all things. Uh, you know, some of the other heroes you had mentioned are Helen Gurley Brown mm -hmm. and Jimmy Carter. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite the cast of characters here. But people see the title Dirty, Dirty, Dirty and maybe not realize it's so tongue-in-cheek and kind of a finger-wagging uh, joke. A friend of mine said he was reading it on the subway and people were looking at him like he was a serial murderer. I, I, Look, I carried it around for me for you know, for with, for a couple of weeks, and uh, yeah, people were kind of like, "Hmm, what's that?" Uh, but yeah, you well, know, it's supposed to, it's supposed to be provocative, but I'm um, you know, it's supposed to be fun too, and uh, I'm finding it scaring a few people, which is what I didn't expect. It's definitely a fun read, and uh, you know, it was just interesting. You mentioned Jimmy Carter a second ago. Funny how Jimmy Carter actually comes off so well, almost heroic in your book, <laughs> certainly compared to some of the other characters. Well, hey, the last honest president. Why not? <laughs> And, and so now that we've mentioned this, explain a little bit about why Jimmy Carter. Why, why does he come off so well 
uh, even though at the time, for the same things we're going to talk about now, he didn't come off so well. Well, I'm not discussing his foreign policy, so he's got the benefit of that. Um, you know, uh, obviously that was his interview with Playboy was very important, and it was probably the last important interview they really ran. I mean, certainly no heads of state have come to talk to them since then, and they kind of burned him. You know, this was the story when he said, I have committed adultery in my heart many times, and it was very famous, and it almost tanked his election. Um, the truth of the story is that he kind of got sandbagged. He was, according to him in his memoir, he wrote that he was walking out the door when the reporter said, hey, uh, Mr. Carter, have you ever committed adultery? And he said, well, why, yes, I have in my heart many times. I've lusted. And, um, and biblically, that's, that's adultery, he said. And he explained, I'm no better than any other man. He was just being very humble, born-again Southern gentleman, as he is. Uh, I think it was probably taken a little bit out of context, what he said. Um, but he was not shown that in the transcript. That was part of the ground rules. He was going to get a look-see at it before it went in the magazine. I didn't really even know that he was on tape because the reporter sort of called him just as he was literally walking out the door. Well, the maelstrom, you can imagine, you know, Jimmy Carter, you know, commits adultery in his heart. People were making fun of him. And all of a sudden, there was a line on the block of these uh, televangelists, uh, an art form that was still being perfected even um, as late as 1976, um, saying, we don't lust in our hearts. This Carter is a very impure man, well, as all Democrats are, right? So it caused quite quite the brouhaha. This does. You know, the crazy thing is, I just wrote something for Huffington Post, um, and it was a slideshow. It was a history of the great moments of uh, girly magazine and sex magazines um, and freedom of speech, based on my book, of course. And there was one slide, and it was titled, uh, 1976, Jimmy Carter Cops to Adultery. All right, it's a teasing headline. Most people do know the story. But the reaction was... This guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> Jimmy Carter never committed adultery. He only did this. It's like, wow, people aren't reading. They're just reacting. And I find that with, with the sex and pornography, people, it, you know, it really puts the hairs on their backs up at end. Um, there have been a lot of reviews in my book that have not even been reviews. They've been using my book to launch platitudes about pornography, pro or con. Um, but everybody's got an agenda. So I was thrilled when Slate called and said we're going to read your book. Not so thrilled when I realized it was the reporter's agenda to talk about the evils of pornography, which isn't what my book is about at all. It's very unapologetic, um, and it's very sex positive, but it's not – I don't have an agenda in terms of thrusting pornography on people. No, no. Uh, anything it, that, and anything it, it, it doesn't come – Anything that's sending impulses for me, but um, I, don't, I don't have that agenda. My book's about free speech, and it's about um, the history of taking the chance to put this stuff on the newsstand. There's a lot in your book about hypocrites. How you know? I mean, uh, the, of course. I mean, it's just tons of hypocrites, and and they, they tend the hypocrites tend to be, uh, Carter, the Democrat, the evil Democrat, uh, acknowledged the you know lusting in his heart. But the Republicans throughout the book are constantly <laughs> you know they're the ones who are on the stump. Oh, we got to stop you know Meese and uh, 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 the, the, Keaton, uh, Keating, and well, Charles Keating. You, you know, um, you know, in the history of criminals and douchebags, he's the most criminalist, douchebaggiest of them all, right? I mean, he is a guy that you know went to jail. I mean, people who try to claim the moral high ground, why is it they're the first ones that end up <laughs> wearing silver cufflinks and being hauled off to the Luskow? Why is that? You know, why is it that the guys that scream loudest about morality are the guys who are always you know, poking, you know, their interns too. Look at Newt Gingrich. Look at, you know, the guys that were screaming for, you know, Clinton's head. And, you know, later it comes out, you know, the impropriety amongst these guys. Why is it the guys who always are the biggest gay bashers turn out to be the ones with the wide stance at the Minneapolis airport? You know, hypocrisy is a default position for the Republican Party. How much, uh, uh, how much research did you have to do for this and how much came from your, your own experiences at being at a lot of these magazines, contributing and being around them? Well, that, that's a nice thing is that I have been um, around these magazines. You know, I know Al Goldstein very well, and I was always very proud of working uh, for Screw, and later became the editor in chief of Screw, um, which was like the best job, um, really, because you know it wasn't even like being on a long leash. There was no leash. We could do whatever we wanted at Screw. It was a license to ill. I'm missing it right now. I'm wa watching, you know, the, the, this motley crew of moron Republicans who think you know they're going to be the president. And, I, boy, do I miss Screw, because what would we do, you know, with Rick Santorum? I know what we'd do. We'd bend him over. Um, <laughs> you, you know, that was, our, that, was, that was our default position for everything. You know, when in doubt, fuck someone up up the ass. Because <laughs> I don't know why, but it's always funny. And that was, you know, I talk about it in my first book. Uh, we had done a spread, 
this is uh, in 2000, uh, when George Bush was running for president, we had a thing called, uh, against John Kerry, and we had a thing called the Manchurian Cocksucker. <laughs> I hope this makes it past uh, the Mr. Media censors. The Manchurian problem. Cocksucker was our best work. We were so excited about it. And so we had George Bush bent over, taking it up, you know, the, we were from Osama bin Laden. We had Hillary Clinton with a strap on, and on and on and on. We had Bill O'Reilly with uh, Michael Moore, you know, and um, the old school, a screw way of doing things was to take still shots from gay pornos and start cutting and pasting. And then, of course, God gave us Photoshop and it became easier. But this was the screw ethos, you know, and it was over the line. You couldn't believe the things we were doing with Condi Rice. <laughs> um, you know, now that we have this technology, God, Rick Semtorum, I'm really trying to um, make um, on Twitter the hashtag, hey, Rick, suck my dick, become a trend. So I hope everyone will join me. Just, you, know, talk, you know, just fuck this guy. You know, I can't believe that this sort of gay bashing is tolerated at such a level of our society. I mean, it's fine if in private, you know, or he wants to talk about marriage being between a man and a woman, but it's bigotry. It's institutionalized bigotry within the party. I would like someone just to walk away from the Republican Party and say, hey, you know what? I'm all for a strong defense, smaller government. Let's balance that budget. I'm for those things. But you know what? I won't tolerate intolerance. That's all. Now, right? It's crazy. I, I, that, was all, that was all fascinating. But let me come back to the question. Did you have to do any research? Yeah, I did a lot of research, um, and I was I was uh, fortunate in that um, Al Goldstein is a friend of mine, and he was very generous um, to talk about a lot of things. Um, Larry Flint was very generous, and uh, gave me his time to talk about the book. Um, I've written for Hustler as well, of course, so I'd sort of been um, around the scene, and I know the story very well. Larry's uh, a hero to me. He's got two bullets in him. He really is the poster boy for freedom of speech. Um, Bob Guccione Jr. Now, Bob uh, Guccione Sr. died while I was writing the book, and no one even really knew who he was, and it was really hard even trying to find him. He had been in a hospice in Texas, but I think um, for a while he'd been in an apartment in New York. He was in New Jersey. He was dying. It was sad. He had lost all his money. It was very much a rags to riches story, I mean, Richard Rag story, I mean, he really, you know, fell off, he had the largest house in Manhattan, this fabulous art collection worth, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, and he lost it all through bravado, uh, incompetence, um, uh, just crazy do-it-yourself uh, egotism, starting with making Caligula, right, which is a movie, right, if you all recall, mm -hmm. Malcolm McDowell, and a uh, story about the Roman Empire, really sleazy movie, nice, you should see it if you haven't seen it, um, I often think, what if John Waters had that budget and that script, what he might have done with it? Um, but as it was, it was a disaster, and he paid for it with cash. Um, and today's money, like $40 million. So imagine going to your ATM machine and taking up $40 million to make a movie. Who does that? He had no other backers, no other investors, and he was bringing bags of cash <laughs> to the set in, in Rome, um, really just sort of sabotaging his own business. He tried to create portable nuclear reactors, I think that cost over $40 million cash, you know. He was like, Dr. No, I'm going to take over the world's energy supply, okay? Uh, cold fusion doesn't work, as we all know. Um, not happening. Yeah, exactly, just like that. And, um, and on and on, he tried to open a casino, it, you know, $80 million down, down the toilet, uh, you know, just sort of stood there on the beach in Atlantic City because pornographers can't get licenses for casinos. Hefner couldn't do it. You know, I mean, Gucci says, no, I can do it, you know. Um, there's no reason why I can't do it. And, of course, they didn't give him a license. They give licenses to mafia guys. But pornographers are, are worse, you know, you know, on, on the social hierarchy, definitely. Um, oddly, actually, I should, I should admit that, because Larry Flint did open a casino in California. Everyone said he wouldn't do it, and uh, there's the Flint um, Poker Club in Southern California. He makes more money off of that than he makes off his magazines. He told me straight up it was the smartest thing he did. But, um, but, yeah, there's a lot of research. Uh, Bob Guccione Jr. gave me the first interview he's ever given about his dad. They were famously estranged for many years um, after the Spin magazine fallout. Um, you know what I'm talking about? They didn't talk, but he talked about his dad. He talked about why I thought his dad was a genius. And um, I'm proud that I was able to give uh, Bob Guccione uh, a new look that I don't think he's gotten. Peter Block, who had been the editor of Pentast for many years, was very, very generous with his time um, in speaking with me. Um, I pointed out that one of the things he was proud of was that Bob Guccione always stood up for veterans' rights. During the Vietnam War, um, when... You know, a limousine liberal like Hefner was sort of like, you know, trying on his <laughs> Nehru jacket, trying to, you know, be a man of the times, which he certainly wasn't. I mean, he's still stuck back in the big band era, you know, Hefner. Um, 
But Guccione supported the veterans. He may not have supported the war, per se, but he said that the veterans are heroes that needed to be treated right. That's something that Penthouse was always very proud of, and I was glad to be able to report that. The pleasure was really looking at Penthouse over the years and realizing what a great magazine it was in the 70s and the 80s. Mm. I think people forget. Um, and also to give credit to Bob Guccione for, you know, the whole bit with the Vaseline on the lens and shooting women through yeah. gauze and stuff. It's a cliche, but he invented it. Right. He invented it, and it works. What he did was he empowered the viewer. You know, the women in Playboy, I mean, they look semi-retarded. They look subnormal. You know, they're, you know, they're looking right at you. Um, you know, and they're all plastic. And, you know, I mean, they're very manicured. And they look like, you know, somehow the little inflatable, you know, you know pop-up tube where, you know, you, you know, you blow them up. It has been airbrushed out with all the hair. I mean, they're, they're silly and kind of stupid looking. But the women at Penthouse were like smoking hot, right? And he really knew how to photograph them. He knew how to how to put this eroticism, this really highly charged um, erotic content, you know, uh, put a frame around it. And like I said, it's a cliche, but he invented that Vaseline thing. And I think if you weren't a quote-unquote pornographer, he would be hanging on museum walls. He would be as important um, as Bob Mapplethorpe, say. Well, Mike, let me ask you about, about Hefner, uh, who I don't think you've worked for. Is that right? No, I've never worked for... Uh, uh, Playboy, and certainly after this book, the phone's not going to be ringing. No. But I mean, but the thing I noticed is uh, you worked for you worked for Flint at Hustler, you worked for Goldstein at Screw, uh, you you basically worked for uh, Guccione Senior at, at Penthouse. At a, at a distance, I wrote a lot of letters for them. Was freelancing for them. Of the four of them, the guy mm-hmm. who comes off the worst is the one guy you did not work for. Is Hefner? You, I mean, I think on one page, I think I made a note. Let me see. On one page, you had one thing. You complimented him for something, but that was about it. Um, do you think if you had worked for Hefner, you might have a more sympathetic view of him? Uh, no, I think I might call it like I see it. You know, I try to be a straight shooter. Um, I give him credit. Playboy owned the 60s. They did some great stuff. Um, I also try to give credit to the art directors of these magazines. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of books about magazines and media um, – Editors get all the credit. You know, it's weird. Magazine editors don't usually get to become rock stars. I mean, the book starts with the, the idea that says, hey, let's play a game, name a famous magazine editor. And it invariably comes back, Hugh Hefner, Larry Flint. Um, you know, if you're in New York or Hollywood, sometimes I got Graydon Carter. Okay? But... Wow, no one even said Gloria Steinem, which was shocking to me. And I took a real straw poll of, you know, a pretty wide range of, uh, you know, people at the bar and some more literary people and some magazine editors I know. And, you know, you didn't get, um, you, you know, uh, Clay Falker. No one mentioned it. Everybody said Larry Flint or Hugh Hefner. It, it was crazy. These guys became famous as magazine editors in a world where you don't become famous. But in Hugh Hefner's case especially, he owes a lot of the credit to Art Paul, his art director, it really made the thing look great. I mean, if you look at the first copy of Playboy, I mean, it, it, it's cobbled together. It's a piece of shit. But um, it was the very beginning. Well, it was. You know, it's a lot of public domain stories. I mean, Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, mm-hmm. you know, the Decameron. Are you kidding me with this? You know, how about something that's been written in the last 200 years? Um, he definitely caught lightning in a bottle with a picture of Marilyn Monroe. I mean, that was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, could not have been better. It was money well spent. Um, but it was Art Paul who sort of had this very mid-century modern layout. He really knew how to um, take illustration and present it as art. I mean, that was really the most important thing he did. If you look in the 60s when they got around to doing James Bond, which was fantastic, you know, presenting the Ian Fleming stories with uh, Leroy Neiman illustrations, long before Leroy Neiman sort of became the shopping mall um, <laughs> doyen, if that's the word I'm looking for. Um, but his illustrations were treated as fine art. You know, in the magazine, it was fabulous. It looked fantastic. The girls looked retarded, but the pages in between looked absolutely great. And that's part of the whole thing. You know, it doesn't work without that content. Like, it, like, as it doesn't work without the girls, you need both for it to make it happen. Mm. What Hefner did is he legitimized nudity on the newsstand. But you don't, he, you, you don't think that uh, your uh, proximity to the other guys gave in, encouraged you to give them a more sympathetic portrait. I mean, because, uh, let's face it, I mean, Hefner comes off horribly in this book. Well, fuck him, you know? The more, <laughs> I, the more I found out about this guy, the more I realized he was a fucking creep, you know? And that he was a real fucking... Um, I mean, look, he's, he's a closet queer, and all good and fine. His bicuriousness does not offend me, I wish, but I wish he would celebrate it. I wish he would wrap his arms around it and just come out and say, who the fuck I am? I'm some old mummy who pads around his mansion, you know, in his pajamas. Bob, what would you say if I came to work every day, if I came to your office wearing pajamas and, and slippers every day? 
I call that the last stop on Straight Street. Yeah. You know, and it's all fine and groovy, except when you're promoting this world where you are like the King Coxman. And also, God, I mean, see, like, Kefner made it cool to be a nerd. And that's what he was. He was a nerd when he was growing up. And he wanted to sit at the cool kid's table. And he, and he got to sit at the table. He got to own the table. Mm -hmm. And the house of the table was in. But didn't anyone notice when the nerd became a bully? Hmm. See, everything I found out about Hugh Hefner just tells me he hates women. Hugh Hefner hates women. It's fucking palpable. He does not like them. Okay? Goldstein... Guccione, Flint, they will unwind miles of lurid Kodachrome of unambiguously pornographic images of millions of women, but only Hugh Hefner chirps like a child at a birthday party while he does it. Mm. He's got a real nasty attitude. We can argue about objectifying women and the value of pornography and the inherent misogyny of it all. Um, that's not what my book is about. But my experience with these other guys is that they put women up on pedestals. I thought that was one, that was a really really interesting point that you made uh, comparing he uh, Hefner to and I'm not defending Hefner it was just something I noticed but uh, you made a really interesting point about him you said that uh, Guccione uh, senior again separating him from Bob uh, junior uh, he had his uh, uh, Kathy Keaton who was uh, involved and, and active who he gave respect to and had a lot of power within his industry it, within his uh, empire uh, Larry Flint had Althea his wife for many years until she died she was when he got shot, especially, she took over. She ran things. That's right. He had a lot of affection for her. And um, uh, uh, Goldstein. Uh, did Goldstein have a woman involved? I'm trying to remember. Well, he's being a little, you know, Al's relationship with women is pretty, pretty well, yeah. historic, troubled. But, but Hefner never did. No, Hefner no, never put a woman in charge. No, well, never his daughter. Power. His well, daughter, yeah. But she had never, as you but, said, she had never but, had another job. But look at the women that Hefner dates. First of all, they're all employees. They're all Playboy, yeah. you know, you know, bunnies, you know, or, or Playboy centerfolds, Playboy models. Um, they're he pays them, okay, which in any other industry, you know, would be seriously looked at, you know, you know, as 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 a moral questionable ethics, certainly. Um, Hugh Hefner's idea of you know finding a suitable woman to date is like to go downstairs, you know, <laughs> the mansion, and see who's hanging out at the bar, or to go to the photo shoot. Um, his women are negative stereotype enforcing bimbos. I mean, they really are. I wish I could speak more highly of them, but they really don't do much to give credit to their, to their gender. Like you said, um, Bob Guccione with Kathy Keaton, um, he put her on the top of the masthead and put her in charge of advertising, something apparently she was very good at. Althea was Larry Flint's muse and very high up on the masthead and within the corporation and trusted. Um, and Al Goldstein, I mean, he didn't have that relationship with women, but he was dating literary agents, you know, and he was dating lawyers, and, you know, and he really liked intellectual women. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the thing I have against Hefner, is he starts in the first Playboy with this, you know, Playboy manifesto saying, we want to discuss Nietzsche and art with, you know, ladies. We want to have them over to discuss global politics. And it's complete fucking bullshit, okay? There is not one of those women who are equipped to talk about, you know, German nihilism or Cubism. It's just not going to fucking happen. Um, I wish it would. I would like. I personally believe in that manifesto. My relationship uh, with women, I like to think, is positive. I love women. They're smarter than we are. I look up to women, um, and you know, I'm not you know naive in what these magazines are are, are for and the fantasy that they provide. But um, personally, I, mean, I like to think my relationship uh, with women is healthy because I do respect them. And that was sort of like you know Hefner's bait and switch, because he doesn't. You know, I mean, the other guys are pornographers. Larry Flint, I'm a pornographer. And, and look, yes, here's a woman, you know, bent over a tractor. But he's what you see is what you get. Right. You know, it's he's like not very, pretending very, to be something uh, else. You know, where Hefner still says that his magazine isn't pornography, that he's not in the sex business, that's a lifestyle magazine. And by the way, their biggest revenue source isn't even that magazine, which is, you know, dying a slow death. You know, despite, you know, trying to get Lindsay Lohan to dress like Marilyn Monroe. Boy, what a sad story, right? I mean, to me, it's like here are two desperate characters, Hefner and Lohan, you know, maybe trying to save their careers. But, like, look at it. The last girl he got to dress like Marilyn Monroe, you know, didn't work out too well uh, either. I mean, she she died young of a, a drug of dose. How did Anna Nicole Smith die, right? And, and Marilyn herself didn't actually have a very happy ending. So I don't know why you'd want to go down this road with a girl who's got a substance abuse problem well, in 2012. Don't, don't, forget that it's got no imagination. Don't forget that Lindsay Lohan looked better nude as Marilyn Monroe in New York Magazine than she did in Playboy Magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's been done already, right? So yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a certain lack of imagination with this sort of thing. But there's Hefner. He's still living in 1953. Well, look, you know. Uh, I've got two more things I want to ask you about. A little bit off 
where we've been, but I, I want to tackle them before we have to let you go. Um, what you you wrote a lot of penthouse letters. Mm-hmm. I love pen. I used to. I would buy penthouse for the letters and Playboy for the interviews, and <laughs> you know, sure. I, I, th- I I'll own up to that. Uh, I had a subscription to pen to Playboy since I was about thirteen. Uh, would pick up penthouse. That's, that's the right answer. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's about right. But <laughs> what I want to know is what are the traditional necessary elements of a letter to penthouse? What what, ah. what had to be in every in every letter? Um, well, and like the porn novels. Ideally, um, that I wrote, I wrote a lot of porn novels. I like to see things play out in three acts. Um, okay, there should be a plot, you know, a premise, um, a conflict, and a resolution. You know, it's, it's very simple. I mean, you know, you, you know, dear Pentas, I never thought this happened to me until I got in that crosstown bus and sat next to the prettiest girl in the world. And then, but there should, it shouldn't happen so easily. There should be a little moment of obstacle to overcome. Once you get into the scene, and once you get in, in there, um, some of the letters are very much uh, insert tab A to slot B, you know, kind of stuff. It's uh, blow by blow. There's some steamy eroticism, and I always say one man's pornography is another man's erotica. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like that, and I know it should be very visual. Um, the stuff that I wrote was, I had this gig where I wrote these things called, like, letters from abroad. So there were um, things that would happen on trains in Paris or, like, hotels in Moscow um, or, or in Spain, places where I'd all been. I'd been to all these places, and I tried to base it as much with this local color and my own experiences, uh, my own adventures, such as they were, um, to breathe some real, uh, real reality into the letters. I mean, the more real they read, the better they are, mm-hmm. I think. Um, the rules are pretty simple. You just got to turn, turn on the radio. Be real, you know? I mean, there shouldn't be any space aliens, you know, coming down, you know, to fuck you because it's not going to happen. Right. Um, certainly, there should be no violence towards women in any, any of these things. Um, and you should never conflate violence and sex. Um, it should be how they should all have happy endings. I don't mean that as a pun or any sort of double entendre, but you're supposed to feel good for reading these things and enjoying them. Right. You're not supposed to be some negative reinforcement for the shame of masturbating. <laughs> All right. well, Which is another one I have for well, problems because he will never admit that people use his magazine for that. But we can, so it's like it's a dirty little secret. We can go I mean, down that on. path, but it's not. No, it's not. All right, last question. Uh, now, I've always been fascinated and enjoyed your writing style, it, uh, as I described at the beginning. That, and you haven't let people down here if they didn't believe my my description. <laughs> that rat a tat tat, you know. Uh, but so I mean, it's it's highly your own. But I, but I, when I when I read you, I'm also reminded of. Uh, Two, I think, contemporaries of yours, and two guys who who I've known and and uh, enjoy a lot, uh, Nick Tosh's and Legs McNeil. And I wondered if I'm, in your mind, if I'm on the right track with those guys. Well, Nick's great. You know, I'm a huge fan, and he was very supportive uh, of me when I wrote my first book. Um, uh, we, we talked a little bit um, about things. Um, Nick's best advice that he gave, he gave me was um, just to uh, be sturdy when the reviews started coming back. You know, for the first book, he's told me, he said, look, Mike, there's always going to be some cocksucker who wants to look tall by standing on your shoulders. You know, fuck him. Your book's great. Don't worry about it. And um, that was that was really good advice. But yeah, I'm very much in awe of Nick. I think he's one of the great American writers and um, both his fiction and nonfiction, especially obviously his biographies. I think his biography of uh, Dean Martin especially is just towering. Dino, yeah. <laughs> accomplishment. Um, I like the way um, things fall together. I like the way... I mean, to me, a lot of what Nick is doing is an extension of um, the new journalism that came before him, uh, Tom Wolfe and a few other people, who I like their approach. I don't like... I'm not influenced by their writing, per se, but I'm interested in the approach they take to their subjects. Maybe Nick has breathed a little bit more in. Uh, his style is something maybe, you know, I've copped a few things here. But I've also copped things from Raymond Chandler and Richard Bradigan and P.G. Woodhouse and places you might not imagine. Mm-hmm. You know, that's sort of how we come to our styles, right? We, you know, cop a few riffs from here and there, and hopefully it becomes our own. Um, legs, you know, we travel the same circles in the punk rock world. Um, I, would, I wouldn't call him an influence, um, except maybe Punk Rock Magazine, which was started with John Holmstrom, who was, who was a good friend of mine. Um, and just the irreverence towards... You know the topic. I mean, my favorite thing that Legs ever wrote was the interview with Sluggo. Is you know from Nancy and Sluggo the comic, and oh, they I didn't did a, see that one. No, <laughs> and that was an early issue of Punk Magazine. Mm. And you know, I mean, that's just sort of like, hey, you know, we can do whatever the fuck we want. There are no rules, right. and that that's an important lesson to learn. All right. So what's next? Um, hopefully, to, uh, we're going to take over the the publishing industry. I'm trying, still trying to get dirty, dirty, dirty out there. You know, I've been touring a lot. You know, I, I do a lot of touring. Um, do a lot of events. I do um. I still tell stories, but I have my band behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, I have this great group of uh, musicians, and um, you should. Uh, I hope you've seen the video. Q Hefner hates girls. 
uh, with uh, my current lineup with my friend uh, John Spencer and the great piano player Mickey Finn and uh, D-Pop on drums, kind of my, uh, my band of ringers. Um, I call them the Interstellar Rendezvous Band. And uh, we go out, we tell, and I tell stories from the book, and some from my first book, and some other things that aren't so germane. But it's very, um, in the spirit of Lenny Bruce, very filthy, X-rated comedy and social criticism. You know, one of the great things about those tours, I was in San Francisco and I was on stage, and I always start the show uh, with the same line, and that is, every day I wake up and thank the Lord that cocksucking is not strictly a homosexual phenomenon. <laughs> But you know, saying in San Francisco meant so much because Lenny Bruce was arrested for using the word cocksucker right. in a nightclub in 1961, you know, in San Francisco. The irony that San Francisco was the cocksucking capital of the world obviously was lost on a uniform cop that arrested him who said, Lenny, you can't, not only can't you say it, you can't do it. It's filthy. It's sodomy. Um, you know, this is not, not the way, you know, people behave. You know, normal people don't do that. And, you know, Lenny felt so bad, you know, not for being arrested, but for the poor cop whose wife had never gone down on him. And we really came brought up. And that's sort of where I got the line. But it's crazy because to think that you could be arrested for this kind of language, mm. you know. And um, since then, obviously, the doors have been opened up for you know like, very filthy comedy. And certainly, people like Eddie Murray and uh, Richard Pryor come, you know, much. And George Carlin certainly very much the mold of Lenny Bruce. But think of all the gangster rap that's out there. I mean, that stuff would have put you in the who's scout for a million years back when. So I think we owe a debt not just to Lenny Bruce specifically, but to all the men that I talk about mm -hmm. in the book. That's sort of the premise of the book um, is free speech. So what's next for me is I uh, expect to continue to exercise my free speech rights in uh, ways that will hopefully be challenging and entertaining and um, uh, informative and elucidating and illuminating. Um, maybe get a few laughs in, in the meanwhile. I'm kind of working on a political satire right now. Mm -hmm. um, Tis the season. Right. Um, and I'm trying to make the hashtag Hey Rick Suck My Dick uh, trend on Twitter. Fuck Rick Santorum. I can't even believe this gay bashing. Right. You know, dude, even, even the NHL puts you in the penalty box for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, listen. You can find writer Mike Edison's enervating, exciting new book, Dirty, Dirty, Dirty of Playboys, Pigs, and Penthouse Poppers in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. Uh, Mike, website, Twitter, Facebook? Uh, Yep, yep. Uh, my website is uh, mikeedison.com. Couldn't be easier. And there's a, there's a lot of content up there. There's lots of videos, and comics, and excerpts. Um, it's a nice trip. So mikeedison.com. Please visit me there. You can follow me on Twitter. I am at Mr. At Mr. Mike Edison. And uh, I am on Facebook. And um, I do post uh, pretty regularly and uh, try to have some fun at it. I think it's, I think it's my responsibility to uh, keep it lively and keep it happening. I won't tell you what I had for breakfast. That's for sure. Okay. <laughs> Mike Edison, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Thanks, Bob. Had a great time. I'm glad to hear it. For more original interviews, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Another good idea? Download our new free Mr. Media mobile app in the Android market. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many parts of the Internet. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by the thepartyauthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line at 1-727-498-4711. Some messages may be used in an upcoming show. And unless you live next door to Mr. Media, there may be a toll charge. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube and Vimeo video channels. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, this is Bob Andelman from Mr. Media. First of all, I want to thank you for years of support uh, listening to this show. 
we're starting our sixth year. It's hard to believe our sixth year uh, as 2012 starts and heading towards our 1,000th online podcast, uh, audio and video. It's uh, pretty amazing, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I remember starting it several years ago thinking, this will never last. And podcasts, that's as stupid a word as blogging. But here we are, <laughs> starting our sixth year and heading up to a thousand interviews. And I want to thank everybody for uh, listening and supporting the show. I also want to tell you that, uh, you know, one of the things that's been very helpful for this show is Stitcher Radio. Yes, this is sort of a commercial. Now, there are millions of smartphone apps in the world, but I only use one several times a day, Stitcher Radio. I build my own radio station to listen to broadcast and online shows when I want and in the order I want. CNN News Update, Onion Radio News, WTF with Mark Marin, MSNBC's Morning Joe, Studio 60, the TechCrunch headlines, and of course, Mr. Media. It's free. It works on iPhone, Android, BlackBerry, Palm Pre, and much more. And you can get it for free for yourself. Try it out. I guarantee you're going to love it. Stitcher.com slash MR Media. That's Stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. You're going to love it. And thanks again for supporting the show.